day. From above the water and below the surface. It's who I am. Join me as I travel the world in search of the most insane fishing experiences on the planet. You got it. Oh, yeah. Big fish right there, Al. Yeah, baby! I'm Al McGlashan and this is Fishing with Mates. G'day, I'm Al McGlashan and welcome to my first ever podcast. Now, I'm a little bit new to this. In fact, I have no idea what I'm doing. So if there's any technical glitches or anything wrong, don't tell me because I don't care. Now, I have the best job in the world. I get to fish around the world, I get to film it, meet some of the most amazing people and go to some unbelievable places, hence the name of the show. So what I'm going to do is just share pretty much some of my life experiences and things that I've done over the years to not only inspire, but to excite people to get back into the great outdoors. We're going to talk about fishing, my love of fishing. And conservation, looking after those fish for the future. This is really, really important to me because you know what? The, well, the world's population is going up way too quickly. So that's real conservation. Then there's the hunting, the photography, feeding your family. There's nothing wrong with taking a fish home to feed, to eat. You know, it's a really important part. We all like letting fish go, but you want to feed the family. And it's so much better getting your own. Then we're going to go... And I've got to watch that because look at that, I can't even get messages coming through. Is it, I wonder if that goes to the outtakes or not. No, it's just going to go with it because this is all raw. This is just straight down the line. But I'm also going to add, with those life experiences, like text messages coming through, is to show you bits and pieces of what I've learned. And that's not just about fishing and hunting and camping and about the great outdoors and all the wildlife, but also about how small business, how you do it, and make it work. And as I do this weekly, we're going to keep coming up with new little ideas. So there's going to be lots of little tip bits for a wide range. Even maybe a bit of cookie in there. Which, chunk of meat on the barbecue, flame it, beautiful. Or out in the bush on the campfire. Or beer battered whiting fillets like I'm going to have tonight. Those sort of things. But it's back to simple. And you know what? If nothing else, if you don't take anything else away from this, you're going to laugh because I keep stuffing things up along the way. And that most important, how my passion for the outdoors, I turned that into a business, into a viable business, I like to say. Bloody hard working, but it is a viable business. But before I go any further, just a word of warning. If you're one of those vegans that live in a city that love using up all the resources and pretending you're helping the environment, we well, can turn this podcast off straight away. Because you know what? This is real life. This is about going out there, catching your dinner, eating it, releasing fish, being a part of nature, being what mankind was meant to do from the beginning. Not this stuff where you sit there using up all the resources. Do you know how much resources you use up in the cities these days? It's the most changed environment on earth. So don't come to me complaining because I ain't listening. I'm about getting more and more people outdoors and loving it and enjoying nature rather than locking up. Because believe me, we'll be talking about marine parks and all these things that just drive me insane. So how did it all start? Where did the Al McGlashan story begin? Well, you know what? I've got to thank my old man for that. As a kid, I've always fished and hunted. Ever since I was born. As long as I can remember, it's been part of my DNA. And it's something to this day that I have to thank him for because he showed me how amazing nature is and how important it is to be a part of it. You know, and it, for me, it is something that I'm now instilling onto my kids and they're going to be part of the show down the track. They're going to be a part of this as well because that's showing the next generation how good the great outdoors is. But I still remember to this day catching my first fish. I remember sitting there in Port Phillip Bay down in Victoria, which is down on the southern end for people that aren't in Australia. It's 
So down in Melbourne, and we're fishing away. In those days, it was hand lines. It was actually a wooden hand line sitting there with, you know, old limerick style hooks, bait fish on the bottom. And when I felt that fish, like it was a flathead. So that's like a, what would you say? Like a flounder, between a flounder and a catfish for everyone in the US and other countries. Beautiful eating fish, but I felt it through the line. And in those days, mono, there was no braid. So we're going, we're going right back. And when I felt that fish on the line, I tell you, it just ignited something into me. It just ignited something in me that to this very day, I still get just exciting. And it's not just a, catching a bait fish or catching a massive marlin. It's catching a fish and pulling it up and seeing a little flathead that was, well, let's just say 30 centimetres long. You know, it wasn't the biggest fish in the world, but it set me off on a career move that has been the best thing of my life. And since then, I've caught thousands of fish. I've travelled the world. I've done all these amazing things. But catching that one little fish as a kid has been the key to everything. And you know what's really important there? That's what this podcast is about. Making sure all you kids, if there's any kids listening out there, get outdoors and go fishing. Go hunting, but respect the environment and appreciate it because it's absolutely awesome. So much better than a computer. Oh, trust me, you've got to use computers, I know. But get out there and do it. Go out there and take photos and put them on your Instagram account. But get out into the great outdoors. Now, so those fond memories, and it's something that I did with my brother, and to this day, I still hunt and fish with my brother. So we grew up doing it. And this is really important for me, is that get families back outdoors. Not just the kids, the whole family. It is the best way to not only engage with nature, but engage with each other. And in this day and age, where we have so many problems with drugs and depression and all these other things, it is essential we get more people outdoors fishing because I am sure that that it helps build those foundations to help you deal with the pressures of life, which seem to be getting worse and worse these days. So, yeah, I'm rambling on, I know, I know. But let's get down to the business. So how did I start? What was it? So I went out and did this as a kid. And you know the funny part? As a kid, you're doing it. And I still remember, I'm going to digress again. Only the other day, we were down at on the Mornington Peninsula again, down in Melbourne, right near where I caught that first flathead. And my youngest son, Cooper, we were out spearfishing. And he was spearing flathead in the exact same spots that I speared them when I was growing up and brought them home and we cooked them for dinner. Do you know how proud that is, that your kids are following in your footsteps, they're cleaning the fish, they're doing it all, and feeding the family? It's something all kids should do. And it's something even now, you know, this is 40 years later, I'd say, something like that, that I'm doing it and spearfishing and fishing down there, and I'm still doing it to this day, and I still love it just as much. But how did I get to this point? How did I end up turning my passion into my career? So in the days of school, now I went to a private school down in Melbourne and, you know, it's a normal thing down there. You know, you, in the days when I went to school, it was incredibly strict. You had to, we even had the cane. Can you believe that? You had to conform. You had to be a doctor, a scientist, real estate agent, all these important jobs, you know, lawyer. They're making a fortune these days, those blokes. You had to do all these sort of jobs. So you pretty much, that was the only way to go. And all I wanted to do was go fishing. All I wanted to do through school, I used to have a teacher there that would tell us how bad it was that I was trying to go away on the weekend. I wouldn't go and do school sport, even though we had spare, you know, uh, reserves there ready to go. He wanted me to play. And all I wanted to do was go and spend time with the family out in the bush. And do you know what? I still, to this day, think that is an incredibly selfish, terrible attitude that some of the schools have. Yes, the kids need to be playing sport. But you know what? Spending time with your family, especially in the outdoors. God, what can be better than that? So back to it. See, I keep digressing. I keep going off on different tangents because I get so excited when I talk about the outdoors. Now, how did it all start? So back there at school, still at the school, I still remember in those days we had career as a, careers advisors and they're sitting there telling me, oh, listen, Al, you know, what are you going to be? Are you going to be a doctor? Are you going to be, you know... Are you going to be a professor like your dad? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? And I went, nah, I'm going fishing. And he's like, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. You can't go fishing. That's not a job. What do you mean it's not a job? It is a job. He goes, no, no, unless you're a commercial fisherman, you're not going to be 
that's it. You you can't go fishing. I said, I'll make my job around my passion. And he goes, you can't do that. That's not possible. He said, you've got to go and do a normal job. And what you do is you go to school, you get good grades. Then you go to university because you've got good grades, so you get into a good course. Then after four, three, five, six, whatever years, then you go and start work. And then when you start earning money and have to cover the house and stuff, then you can start going fishing and in your spare time. I went, well, why don't I start with the fishing and build everything else around that? And he goes, that's not possible. Well, you know what? He was deadly wrong. And to this day, thank God my parents supported me a little bit ambivalently at times and said, get out there and give it a crack. And I tell you, to this day, it is the best thing I ever did. And if there's one thing I want everyone to go away from this is to get inspired. Whatever your passion, do it. Don't let people hold you back. So I left school, did a lot, and I ended up, I was still fishing like mad. I was doing marketing at uni and all these sort of things. And we were fishing at Bermagui, and I still remember this guy came up, and we are catching marlin way back in the days where they were really rare because we'd gone to Hawaii for a holiday, learned how to catch them, and we are catching a few of them. So what happened was a guy came down the boat ramp and said, oh, how'd you go? I said, oh, yeah, we got two marlin. And he goes, where are they? And I went, mate, we let them go. We weren't going to kill them. And he goes, well, you didn't catch them, walked off. Because in those days, and we're talking a few years ago, I hate to admit, people kept fish because they ate them. There wasn't this catch and release ethos like there is today. So I went and got a camera and started taking photos. And that's where it started to kick off. At the same time, I thought, right, this is going to be my career. How am I going to make this work? So what I'm going to do is, what's the best way to do it? I'm going to do my own guiding operation. So I tried the guiding operation, doing the photos, and you know what? It didn't really work because the people I took out didn't always appreciate what they saw. So that didn't do. So then I moved into the tackle trade and I started working. I did my sports. They used to have a big sports one. I used to do all their fishing stuff down there. And then I moved to the infamous Complete Angler back in the days when Jimmy Allen had it and learned the trade. And you know what? They pretty much sacked me because all I wanted to do was go fishing. I didn't want to sell the stuff. I just wanted to go fishing. But I learned one really important thing there for anyone in the tackle trade is you're not selling products. You're selling a dream. So if you can help them achieve that dream, your store will do better. And that's not just fishing because I worked for Ray's Outdoors for a while as well. It's the same thing. It's about people want to go around Australia. They want to catch a big fish. It doesn't matter what you sell them. You sell them the right stuff that's going to help them achieve that dream. And to this day, I'm still friends with people I used to work with and, and used to shop in the in the stores in those days. So that's really important. You've got to remember that. A little tip for you there. So what happened? So I did the guiding, moved across, did the uh, tackle trade, which I wasn't the best at. And then we get back to Bermagui where I caught those fish. And we're catching more fish and I started taking more photos. So by this time... I'm starting to build up a little repertoire of photos. Now, they're not digital. They're all slide film in those days. And Bill Classen, who runs AFN, which is one of the better or one of the bigger sort of fishing media companies there. They've got a TV show. They've got fishing magazines. But they just started Sport Fishing Magazine. And Bill said, come down, show me some of your slides. So I took them down, little A4 thing, all the slides there. And he goes, you know what? You string a few words together. And I'll publish it. Now, bear in mind that I was a D student in English at school, which is pretty much dumb. I wasn't very good at it. And the only thing I did well on in my HSC, VCE, whatever it was back in those days, was writing a story for a magazine. So it was like a, a one that you'd publish for. And that was the only thing I did well on. So Bill said, you string some words together, I'll do it. And I still remember to this day writing up about fishing at Coffs Harbour and the day I opened that magazine, the news agents, and saw my photos in there, my story, my little piece, I realised what I was doing. I was going to, I was going to become a journalist. That's it, straight away, no question about it. So I went home, told the parents, mum and dad, said, "Listen, I'm going to start writing." Mum was a little bit horrified. She saw bigger things in those days. And dad, now dad had gone to Harvard. He got a scholarship over there, so he'd always drum the marketing in. And he just sat there and said, "Now listen." If you're going down this track, not a problem at all. But remember, when you're taking photos and doing all this stuff, you're not doing it for you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it because it's a product. You're doing it 
so that these people that are buying it, that's who you're doing it for. So your editors and ultimately people that read the magazines. So he said, always remember your core. So the ones you start with and you build out from there, always don't forget those stepping stones. Don't get too, you know, too top heavy and fall back down. So then all of a sudden, as I start writing for more and more magazines, you know, you're getting out, like I was putting articles out every week. Suddenly, you start getting all these offers. You know, people are ringing up going, oh, we want you to go to Cairns. We're going to take you to Papua New Guinea fishing, you know, promote our operations. So suddenly I changed my business structure a bit and focused on all the trips because all of a sudden you do a trip, it doesn't cost you anything because you're giving them this awesome content they want and you're doing it cheap with them. So it's a real win-win situation. So suddenly I was going to plays and then I'd write a story for an Australian magazine, one for the US, one for the European market. They get access to your images. So it started building the business and it was a really important part. And I still remember Midway Atoll. Now, I remember when the guys rang me up and said, would you like to go to Midway? I went, where the hell's that? They go, North end, northern end of the, um, it's the northern end of the Hawaiian chain. Really remote, Battle of Midway. I went, oh, I want to go there. And we flew over to this place and it's an amazing spot because, you know, it got bombed. It's got all this ex- old military stuff there, but it's covered in wildlife. There's thousands of albatross. There's insane fishing especially GTs. Now, Giant Trevally, they're now hugely popular, but in those days, no one really cared about it. And there were 40 and 50 kilo fish just swimming around the back of the boat. We were feeding them at the docks, like the guys were doing it. And the funny thing is, the guys now that I fished with there, Sheeds and all that, Sheeds is down in Guatemala, and we've got um, the other boys are over, where are they? They're over in, uh, I think someone's in Panama, and someone's over off in... You know, the, um, what do you call it? The Galapagos, there's people everywhere. And they were the guys we fished with. But this is a really, really funny story. Now, when we went over, we're on the plane flying over, and I swear this is true, and we're sitting there, and a couple of guys there, a bunch of American guys were flying over, and one of them, Andrew Dean and his brother Ken Dean, go, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm, f- I'm going over to do some stories. And, like, you know, we hit it off, start chatting. They go, oh, well, who do you write for? I said, I've just done one for an American magazine big game journal and they said what's it called i went i know aussie trolling techniques something like that and they went really and he opened it up and it's on the page he's reading the story in the plane right next to us how bizarre is that but it gets better so after that we all hit off like a house on fire i came back and i got my first ever cover shot with the gt and that was it but andrew and he worked in the old in the world trade center he went home and, you know, when he was, when we were there, we are chatting away about it. And I said, listen. He goes, oh, I've got stomach ulcers. I've got all these things from stress. I said, mate, you don't need that. Go back. Tell your boss to stick it. You're not doing it anymore. Because his boss wouldn't let him go at one stage, all these sort of things. So he just said, bugger it. So he went back and quit. And guess what? There's no World Trade Center now. And even more bizarre, when it actually got blown up, I was in Mombasa in Africa, which is the last place those little terrorist buggers blew up. How bizarre is that for a story? All because we met on on Midway Atoll. So bloody good story. And you know what? He's fishing hard these days as well. So more and more stories. And that started building and building. And and that's something that diversified into books. Now, that was the next area that I really started to work on. And I did my first book, which was How to Catch Australia's Favourite Fish and then Australia's Favourite Fishing Spots. And then I did the Complete Fishing Bible, which was an almighty success not because of me sadly because of the way it came out so everyone that buys books is generally female and they don't buy fishing books but they buy presents for their dad their brother their boyfriend their husband whatever so with the complete fishing bowl they go oh what type of fishing does he do oh, i don't know he does something and so complete that's everything right fix that and then in the back end Rach, by the half, she did a cooking section and we got really good photos. So what do they do? You open from the back, really good photos. Girls I like cooking, bang, bought it. And that book's now sold, I don't think it's 100,000, but it must be close. And I like to say it's because of my skill level, but no, nah, just the right spot at the right time. But it just started putting another feather in the bow and that started building. And at the same time, photography was changing. 
So we would move, we'd moved out of slide film and we're coming into digital. And I still remember the guys at Canon telling me, oh, you know, that was a, it was a 10D back in those days. We want you to do, we want you to use that. We want you to go in digital. I'm like, ah, no, it looks flat. And they lent me a camera and I was doing a shoot for a Blue Water magazine. I was going down to South Australia. So I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll shoot the slide film and I'll shoot digital side by side and see how it comes out. And the slide film came out, beautiful colors, magic stuff. And the, the digital, it was flat and grey and lifeless. And guess what? Blue Water Magazine only used the digital photos. And it was at that point I realised I had to go across and start buying the gear. And I still remember I bought my first ever 5D and I was so nervous because in those days it was five grand to spend. And it was such a mission to go in there. Like I'm breathing deeply to go in and buy this camera. And of course... They didn't want any of the old SLRs, that the slide film cameras. They were all worthless by that stage. You know, it literally turned over overnight. And if there's one thing we learn now, and it's happening faster and faster these days, is that well, everything is really quick. So if something changes, you've got to be on it, because otherwise you're left behind. So I went digital, and it was the best thing I ever did. Now I love it. And the younger generation these days don't realise or appreciate just how good it is for them. Because when I took one of my most famous photos, so we were fishing off Sydney, Doug O'Lander had rung me up and said, Al, I need a photo of a guy getting speared by a marlin. Like, how the hell am I ever going to get that? I went, oh, rightio. And the next day we're out off Sydney and we're backing down on this fish and they're yelling at the poor bloke to stand over Black Murray, his name was, get over the back, we're on a striped marlin, get over the back and tag it. And he was saying, oh, rightio. So he stepped over the back the guy driving the boat pulled out a gear and with Marlin, you've got to be going forward or back. You've got to be doing something because they don't stop. So if you stop, they keep moving. And this Marlin's gone. Wait a minute. And as I've seen it happen, I've raced down the back, leaning over the side, and I've got the photo. First, the Marlin jumping up with him trying to tag it. And then the second shot of the Marlin screaming up over the gunnel and pitting him square in the clacker. That's the bum. And you would not get it. And do you know what? I had no idea I'd got the shot. I thought I had it, but I couldn't do anything. I had to go back the next day. I went into the processing lab and sat there and waited for them to come out so that they'd pull the strip out so I could go through, and I had that shot. And I'll put it up on Instagram today so you can see it. And I tell you what, to this day, it's still one of those amazing shots that had never been done. But you know the funny part? I rang Doug Olander, who's the editor of Sport Fishing Mag in the US, or I actually sent him an email, saying, mate, got the shot, got a really good shot of a bloke getting speared square up the clacker. He sent back, I'm not sure what clacker means, but I think I've got the I think I've got the gist of it. And it ended up being a double page spread for the magazine. But that was in the days of slide film. Today it's digital. And do you know what? To the younger guys listening to this podcast, you just don't realise how easy it is. You take a photo, you look it on the screen, go, nah, I could do better. Our days we took the photo and went God, I hope that roll of film comes out. You know, we'd have the film in the fridge. Technology has changed it, made it a whole lot easier, so you still have to appreciate it. But I tell you what, those days of slide film, and I think they made us good photographers because we had to get all our settings right. But the area that I tried when we're doing slide film that has now become my signature is underwater. When I did slide film, it was really hard. Now, with digital it is perfectly made for underwater because if you stuff something up, you can fix it straight there on the spot. And now we're doing all these shots and, you know, everyone's getting into it and the technology is getting better. But you know what? I love it because everyone can come out and share that, show us their, you know, amazing shots that never before. God, you can do it on your bloody phone these days. So it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing how technology's changed. And for your business, for anyone starting a business in media, you've got to be abreast of that. You've got to keep going and be you know, ahead of it the whole way through. But you know what? The technology or keeping abreast of technology is only part of it. Because the key to small business in media like mine is all about the image. Now I'm not talking about being good looking and a fancy car. I'm talking about the shots you take. 
it used to be for me, it was all about the magazines. That was the be all end all. Of course, now it's social media and it's all online and it's changed dramatically. But what it's also done is mean we've expanded out because of this technology. So we're now doing video, we're now doing photos, we're doing it on iPhones, we're doing fancy cameras. It really has changed. But I often get asked the question, it's all about the pick, yes, but how do I get that pick? Because in back in the very early days, I remember doing one of the magazines and I said, how do I improve? What do I do to be better at, you know, I want to write more articles, all that. And he turned around and said, I can do anything to your words, but I can do nothing to your images. And while it's changed a bit over the years, it still rings true that you have to get awesome images. It's the only way that people get excited. So with my fishing, it changed over the years. It went from wanting to catch the fish. Everything revolved around getting the shot. Now, this is amazing because I love catching fish, but all of a sudden, as soon as the action started, I'd stop and completely go the other way, put the rod down and shoot it. And that's where I started finding, because you capture that moment, you know, that split second where someone's loaded up, the rod's bending over, the line's screaming. And of course, now with, you know, the, with the digital era, is we can video and do stills. In fact, I'm shooting 4K for a lot of it, so I can actually pull stills out of the video. Like, it, it really is unbelievable how much technology's changed. And by the time, God, in the next week or so when this podcast is up, you know what's going to happen? There'll probably be something new out because we're using drones, we're using underwater, doing all these, just all these different elements to capture it, and it's giving us almost, God, you could almost say a 3D view of everything. And I find that absolutely amazing. So what can I recommend with, well, with taking photos? Well, with mine, it's always been SLRs, and, you know, these days your iPhones can do it pretty well, especially for Insta and those smaller things. It's good glass. The better the glass, which is on your lens, obviously, the better the glass, the better the shot's going to be. Because the camera body itself is changing, you know, every every year, every six months, God, every month now, there's a new camera out and a better version. But I'm still using the same glass that I shot with, I think I've got a 7200 there, 2.8, which is now almost 20 years old. First one I bought, and I'm still using this day. So for all my Marlon photography, it doesn't look as good as it used to be. I could be completely honest. Actually, it's beaten up to buggery. It is falling apart, the poor old girl. But you know what? It's still working, and it really highlights just how certain parts of technology change, but other parts still say the same. So spend the money on the best glass you can. That's some of the best advice I can offer. And it's not just about snapping photos. Don't just hold it up and, you know, the grinning grip, someone's holding a dead fish. Oh, for God's sake, stop taking those photos. Let's get the action. Let's capture that action. So when someone's hooked up and fighting, You've got the excitement on their face. You've got the rod load over. The rod fish goes under the boat. You've got this point where the rod's lifting up and it's hurting them. That's what we want to capture. And that, that's the same whether you're doing it for Facebook, Instagram, for your mates on Snapchat, you know, for magazines and books, and, of course, for TV. All these things, it's capturing that moment because the exciting thing in fishing is the bite. Like, when you think about it, what's exciting about watching someone else wind a fish up? especially like a tuna or something. It just hurts and it's boring. It really is. Like for photography, there's not much in it. It's the start and the end of the fight. So the bite, oh my God, that's the best bit. And then at the end of the fight, when you land it and that elation of catching it. So, you know, it seems like I'm digressing from talking about how my career started to letting all these tips out along the way now. Like, oh, oh well, but it's all good because the more people doing it, the better it is. Now, on top of that, for anyone wanting to do this style of, like, to take on a career as the best job in the world, I was saying just before about when the action starts, you stop. Put the rod down, start taking photos. And I'll tell you what, that is a skill in its own. I've had over the years heaps of people going, oh, I'm going to do what you do, it's all awesome. As soon as the fishing's gone, they're all fighting fish, going, oh, yeah, that was unreal. And then at the end, they turn around and go, oh, I'll get one of those, I'll get a snapper or whatever we caught, which is now an ice lost all its colour, and I'll get a photo. And you go, that doesn't work. You're not capturing the moment. You haven't got those shots, those be there shots where you look at it and go, I want to be there, of half dead fish. That's not going to work. I remember years ago, I had a guy in Melbourne, he goes, oh, I'm going to do a career like yours. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this and this. I'm going here and I'm going to do this. 
came out fishing with us. The snapper were going off. Every rod's going off. He caught like 10 fish, turns around and goes, mate, you, did, you only caught one. I caught like five. I shot like 250 photos, shot a whole magazine feature, like all the photos for it. And I said, but you haven't got any photos, mate. He goes, yeah, but I caught the snapper. There's the thing. I've got the photos. That's the job. That's what we need. And here it is all of a sudden. He's, he didn't realise. Needless to say, he didn't last too long. So if you want to do it, it's not about being in the photo. It's about getting the photo. You can be in some, but you can tell you've got to go and get the photos. Getting the shot is the priority. And with mine, as I was saying earlier on, that we started doing more and more trips away. And, you know, I got sent all around the world. And the important thing is I'd go there to shoot photos. Don't go there to fish. I go there to get the other guys to fish, so I get the photos. So I'd come home and I'd write five different features because I have so many photos. And of course, some of the competition would go over and catch like all these fish and have like four photos. Remember, you're producing a product. That's the thing that's been the the crux of my business is that I'm not taking photos for myself. I'm not catching the fish for myself because that doesn't pay the bills. I'm taking photos to produce content to help other businesses build to build my business that's what it's all about and now as we moved into yeah as i keep saying into digital and that does make me sound old doesn't it think about it i'm talking about the digital era digital era which has been gone for i think it's 10 years like that's how far behind the times i'm still talking slide film but the important thing is it's making everything easier and now like we're saying you can use drones you know there are regulations got to work around those register yourself make sure if you're doing it commercially and stuff and, and obviously under two kilos here in australia and other countries are different rules and there's some crazy dumb rules around them as well but it's around working around you know and utilizing all the technology to get all the stuff because now we're using multiple platforms We've got, you know, social media. We've still got magazines, still got papers. People still read papers, unbelievably, you know, and they read a lot of them. There's still, a, well, my column in the Daily Telegraph still gets up to a million readers on a Friday. Think about it, a million people still. Still old school. So, yeah, so it's it's using all of those. So you want those shots and it's they're not easy. So you're always looking at it and trying to predict and trying to work how it how it's going to come apart and you know that probably the most amazing thing i've never ever done a course in my whole life never done a course so when they go oh you know do you need to go to uni do you need a degree do you need this that no you don't you don't need anything you just go out and learn by trial and error so one of the most important things with photography is reading the shot and by that i mean you're not just there and snapping away hoping for it you're looking at situations what's about to happen now, we had Audie Gilcroft who came over as a photographer for us. Now, we're down doing fishing with mates on a TV show. And we had two boats were in Mull Whaler. And she's in the other boat trying just to get those natural shots. But what she did was she kept looking at the situation and reading it. You know, we're coming in against a nice bank. It's nice dark green vegetation. Oh, that's going to make a nice shot. So she was preparing for the shots in advance. So don't just go and snap them. Focus on what you're doing and looking at and read what's about to happen. It's the same with Marlin photography when I do that. You don't just point the camera out and hope for it. You're reading where the line's going, so you're trying to work out where the fish is going to come up. And it's not an easy skill. You've got to know your subject, so you know where it's going to come up. And I pre-focus trying to predict where it's going to actually come out of the water. And it's the same. Audie was doing a similar thing. She's looking at it, trying to read those spots that make really good shots. And the, the photos she got in the are outstanding. But the point is, it's about looking at it and trying to read read what's happening and always being aware of your situation. Horses for courses? Well, in my case, there are no courses. Everyone asks, oh, what course did you go and do? How did you do it? I never went and did a course. I never did a photography course in my life. I learned everything by trial and error. And you know what? I stuffed up heaps along the way. Like it's been amazing, all the stuff I've done that I've stuffed up. But every time you stuff up, and especially if it's your own business, you learn. I've flooded housings for underwater. I've broken cameras. I've smashed cameras. I've dropped cameras. I've missed shots I shouldn't have. All of this taught me to be a better photographer. So it's about reading the shot. So with photography, you don't just snap. You're looking and trying to read what's about to happen. So you're preempting. So when I do my marlin photography, I don't just point it in the general direction, hope for the best. Instead, I'm looking where the fish is going to be. I'm going to try and predict where he's going to come out. So I'm watching the line, watching what the anglers are doing. 
and I'm pre-focusing on the spot I think he's going to come out. You don't always get it right, but when you do, oh, the photos are amazing. Mar Marlin photography in the early days when I did it is absolutely one of those things. There are only a few of us, that, a couple of guys in the US and John Ashley, who's probably one of the best here, were doing the photos pretty much in the world, and it was awesome days, you know. You're getting these photos and everyone's going, oh, that's it. And no one was getting them. Now everyone does it, you know. So in those days where no one was doing it, absolutely amazing. But it's not just Marlin photography. It's all photography. So only a couple of weeks ago, I had Audie Gilcroft come over and sort of, she's a fledgling photographer from Western Australia. And she was shooting for us while we're doing Fishing with Mates, my TV series. We're down at Lake Malawela with the guys from Complete Angler. And we're sitting there. We've got two boats. We're chasing, obviously, Murray Cod. And which is an iconic Aussie species. So for people who don't know, Murray Cod is one of the biggest freshwater fish in the world and one of the, the oldest growing. They grow to, I think it's 50 years of age. Like, that's an old fish. Anyway, we're chasing those and we're filming. And what was happening was that Audrey was in the other boat and she's reading the situation. So by that, I mean, she's looking at where we're fishing. Oh, there's a nice green, you know, the green sort of vegetation in the background the boat's going to stand out the light's going to hit it oh, i'm going to get that shot so she was constantly preempting shots and in the end she got some absolutely outstanding shots but what we can learn from this is that she wasn't just willy-nilly taking pics she was trying to focus and pick the shots and it really is important whatever photography you do whether it's a guy fighting a fish, whether it's someone running, whatever it is, you try and predict, you know, oh, the light's going to be over my shoulder here, that's it. So you're aware of the situation to maximise and get that best shot. And it's funny because so many people don't realise, all my mates take a photo and they miss your head, so they don't even compose the shot. Where It's pretty simple. This is just talking grin and grip. You hold the fish up, roll it over, make sure the light's on the fish and the angler so it's coming over the photographer's shoulder. This is my simple way. And for God's sake, get them all in the shot. Don't make them some little distant thing in the distant, you know, this little speck in the middle of the screen. Fill the screen with them, but don't cut their head off at the same time. Do you know how hard that is for some people to do? It is ridiculous. Some guys are absolutely terrible at it. Drives me insane. And for us now, as where images are becoming so important, taking the time just to get a half-decent photo isn't that bloody hard is it really come on and for us too we're letting so many fish go for me it's such a priority to get a good photo of the fish but do it in a way that that fish still swims off because too many people don't look after and we've seen this with murray cod and a few other species that they catch the fish put it on the deck go and find the camera finally get it look after the fish these fish are too precious you can't treat them like that you must look after them and look after them properly so they swim away. So when you catch a fish that you're going to take a photo of, here's how you do it. Let's use a Murray Cod. You've got him, he's in the net. You go and find the camera. You turn the camera on, you set the shot up. Again, what I was saying before, like I was saying about Audie, is you get the camera. So you go, righty you're going to lift the fish up. You're going to sit in the bow of the boat. The sun's coming out of my shoulders here. I want you to hold the fish like that. I've got the camera ready. Bang, 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 done. They lift the fish up. Comfort lift them if they're a big fish. Don't drag them over the side. Look after these fish. Bring it up. Hold it gently. Get the photos. Make sure you're smiling. Just smile. You've got to be happy. You caught a big fish. Smile. And then put it back in the water. And you know what? You can do that in about 10 seconds and get awesome photos. And that fish is back in the water. Put it back in the net if you want. You can do it again. Let him relax the net. But don't leave him on the deck. Put him back in the bloody water. It really is important. And people are learning, but you know what? We've got to get this right because we've only got a limited number of fish out there that we've got to protect. Once you've got that, so we've gone through all this, the other area of my business, so the photography built, and I've obviously digressed and gone off about how to do it rather than talking about it. We built up, you know, I obviously went from magazines to books and, and it's still to this day, and now I sell as content for advertising and yeah, it still builds. And obviously it's changing. It's a changing environment. It seems to be constantly changing these days. So magazines have sort of slipped down a bit. Um, social media is obviously an important part, which is more a platform for us for showing off what we've got to, to you know, advertisers and, you know, companies and becoming brand ambassadors. Because these days we're not like we were in the old days where we were simply 
specialists or experts in the field, we're now influencers as well, which you don't have to actually be a special person. I mean, let's let's face it, some people that have got that are famous on whether it be YouTube or Instagram or all these things don't do anything special. Not at all. But each to their own, that's what they get and people are watching it, probably worry a little bit worried about the human race with their intelligence level sometimes. But you know what? It's important. So for me, it's it's the business has now moved across into doing, you know, into the social sides become so important to it. And it is. If you ever doubt it, have a look how many people are on their bloody phones. But you know what? How's this? The one thing that is still the biggest influence for us above all else? TV. So we still get the biggest response above all other mediums, social media included, TV. It still works. And people still watch it. And in the early days for me, I always, always wanted to do TV. So I tried for years and years, and I did, a, I think my first stint was with um, Fishnet TV. Fishnet used to be an online, like one of the, the forums, and it took years and years, and I worked hard, never got anywhere, did that, it didn't sort of keep going. And in the end, I met up with a guy called Ron Croft and started doing Strike Zone DVDs, and that changed everything for us. Ron and I... We changed because we wanted to make it different, not winding fish up. Like I said, they're boring watching someone wind a fish in, catching the bite. Getting that bite on camera was what it was all about. So we turned around and made a camera, or Ron made it really, that was that you control. So you could actually see, and I still remember to this day, the first time we did it, we had the little little clam, so the little screen up in the boat, my little center console. We're driving along. We tied a live bait to the back of it, little bait fish to the back of it, and drive along and it's going along upside down and this kingfish came screaming up and ate it right in front of us and i, to the, I still look at it going and it was just off north head just off sydney and i just went oh, that's the stuff this is what i'm gonna do this is it and that set me on a career path into tv which has built and built you know we, we did strike zone then we went on to strike zone tv which we did for channel 31 and then we moved into uh, big fish, small boats, and we did docos like Game Fishing Australia and Samoa. And then, of course, we've come into, and I'm probably going to do a whole podcast just on this because so many people seem to be interested in it, on fishing with mates and how we've lifted it up and changed it because fishing shows used to be infomercials. Let's face it, a lot still are. And people don't want to be flogged products. I don't want it. I want to learn, you know, I want to see fishy, I want to be inspired and I want to be entertained. So we fought long and hard and fishing with mates today is all about the excitement of fishing and fishing with your mates. That's basically what it is. We go fishing with our mates. So it's changed. But what I've loved is my my passion for the underwater photography and filming has come into its own with this so that, and it goes back to Strike Zone, is that it was about filming the bite. So now I jump in with marlin and sharks and tuna and film them in their natural environment. And I'll tell you what, it has just given me a whole new appreciation of how amazing the underwater world is. You know, you jump in with a huge sunfish, and which could be a ton, like the biggest bony fish on earth, and swim around with it. And obviously with instances with sharks, like if we're talking famous photos, the underwater shot I've got of the mako eating the marlin is still... I still look at that every day. It sits here in my office right behind me and I look at it going, I can't believe that photo. It's just there. It's just out there. It's one of those things that I look back and just go right spot at the right time and press the right button. But just obviously digressing again is the underwater, which is becoming more and more my passion. But you know what? Let's do a whole podcast on that alone. This one was really about how I started and how I got to this point in the career. So rather than go into all the other bits, let's just go back to how I got the best job in the world or how it kept going, I should say. So now we've got TV, we're doing books still. We just released uh, Fishing Australia, I think it was. God, I don't even know the name of my own book. And we're still doing magazines, like Club Marine Magazine, still strong and still doing photos and still producing content now for Shimano, Yeti, uh, Mitsubishi, Complete Angler, Halco. God, there's so many people I work with, and they're all good people. In fact, you know what? That's probably worth something worth mentioning. Sponsorship. 
if you want to work with these companies, it's all about what you can do for them. Getting, you don't get anything for free. You earn it. And when you earn it, you have to give back twice to what you earned. I know that sounds silly, but that's what it is. So sponsorships, don't go and go, I want to be sponsored. Show them what you can do. Show them what you can produce for them because there's 50,000 other people going, I want to be sponsored. I want a free reel. I want lures. And if you want to get paid for it, you have to produce because ultimately, as a brand ambassador, you need to be an influencer selling their product. So you need people to go, that's a good product. And if there's one thing that I can say that I would always do is always stand true. Don't just do it for the money, and heaps do. They swap and chop and change for the money. Well, I've been with the likes of Halco for probably 15... God, it could be longer. It could be, be 15 years at least, I'd say. And they still make a bloody good lure. And I still stand by it. Shimano, all the stuff I I sponsored or work with, it's because I use their products. It's not because they pay us or anything else. It's because I honestly believe in their products. And do you know what? A lot of them have products I don't actually use or don't like, so I won't use them. So that's one thing, is that anyone coming in, it's a lot of hard work. Be true and always be genuine. You've got to be authentic because if you're not passionate about it, you cannot have the best job in the world. So that, I reckon, is going to finalise my first ever podcast. It's a bit of a background, a bit of all the things I've done over the years. We're going to start focusing, and going forward, we're going to do how to marlin fish. We're going to do how to do better underwater photography, more work in, you know, more how to improve your business. Uh, We're going to throw some hunting in there, some camping, all the things that have happened in my life. So stay tuned, because there's a whole lot more with Al McGlashan. DNA from above the water and below the surface. It's who I am. Join me as I travel the world in search of the most insane fishing experiences on the planet. You got it. (laughs) Big fish right there, Al. Yeah, baby. Size of it. I'm Al McGlushin and this is Fishing with Mates. Yahoo!